Okay. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for uh, uh, the online students for joining class. Sorry, few of y'all, but we'll, uh, by the time we begin, I'm sure the others will uh, join us as well. Can you hear me? Um, online students, can you hear me well? Is it? Yeah, okay. Thank you, Nina. Okay, let's begin. Uh, we'll begin with a word of prayer. So can one of you, uh, any one of our online students, can you please lead us in prayer, please? You can unmute your mic to lead us in prayer. Anyone? Any online student like to pray? Okay, I'll, uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, I have didn't hear any response. Can you hear me? We can't hear the online students. Sorry, we couldn't hear you. We couldn't hear the online students. Uh, can one of the online students please unmute your mic and speak so that our students here can help with the voice, the sound system, whether it's whether you're audible or not? Any one of the online students, can you please unmute and speak something? Hello? Hello? Yes. Hello? Now we can, yeah. Thank you, Arila. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, Nina John, did you lead us in prayer? Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Can you please uh, lead us in prayer? Sorry for that. Okay. Okay. Gracious Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Thank you for this day and time that you have given us, Lord, that we can come to your feet and learn from you, Lord. Thank you for all that, uh, the insights and what the, we have been learning, Lord, in the past few weeks. We commit ourselves once again to your hands today. Commit Pastor Selena and each one of us that our eyes of spiritual understanding would be opened. We would imbibe and grow in, our, in the grace and knowledge of you. For we ask in Jesus' precious name. Thank you, Nina John. Thank you for your patience and love. Playing again with us. Okay, um, so last class, you all remember what we did? Anyone? What are we studying on, basically? We have to speak loud. Price? Price, soul, and creation. Okay, why are we studying uh, price, soul, and creation? I don't know, can you, can you request you to please um, mute your mic? Thank you, Arila. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, why are we learning about Christ's role in creation? Why are we looking at Christ's role in creation? Why are we studying it? Our online students can also answer. Why are we studying Christ's role in creation? Just because, just out of the blue, we're studying that? To prove that he is God, okay? We're basically studying uh, in Christology. What are we going to be studying in Christology? We are 100% man, 100% God. Who? Okay, we're trying to prove, full sentence. We have to, tr we're trying to prove that Jesus is fully God and fully man. So we're studying his deity and we're studying his humanity. We're basically, we're studying how humanity and divinity coexisted in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay. So as theological students, very important for us to speak in 
a uh, little more theological terms okay so we're saying 100% man 100% god who what you know um, we're looking at how deity and humanity coexisted in the person of jesus christ how can a person who is fully human how can he also be fully divine at the same time okay uh, in the same manner so we're looking at uh, we're studying that and so to prove that jesus is fully fully god what did we study about what are the different aspects of his deity that we studied about how can we prove that jesus is fully god Hey guys, you'll have to really look up your uh, notes and come to class. You can't uh, just get out of bed and come right to class, okay? That's not fair. Okay, our online students, uh, how do we prove that Jesus is uh, deity, that he is God? You can unmute your mics and speak. We can now hear you. Yes. He created, he's a creator. Okay. Yes. He is the image of the invisible God, the a perfect manifestation, the representation. Then it went on, we went on to see that how he was the firstborn of all creation, meaning uh, first in priority, first in rank. And uh, he's how he's sovereign, he's above all things. So those then uh, he's supreme and of course just now we said that all things were created by him and then he sustains all things by the power of his word so we looked at all those things in scripture and uh, the brightness of his glory and uh, i think we the last thing that we ended on last week was how you know the conservation of all mass and energies i mean we are not able to say how it happens but it says that uh, get, science itself cannot say, but then he, it says that all things are created by him and all things are held together by him also. So, Thank you, Nina John. So we looked at the whole aspect of uh, God, uh, Jesus as the creator. Okay. He is the uh, creator. He was there uh, when creation uh, took place. He was the one who brought things to, into existence, God the Father was the one who, what did God the Father do in creation? What was God the Father's role in creation? Sorry? What was God the Father's role in creation? Huh? He planned everything, thank you. It was his... Uh, his his plan okay what else well, what is uh, jesus's role in creation sorry he spoke everything okay and what is the holy spirit's role in creation huh don't murmur please i can't hear you if you murmur <laughs> what is uh, the holy spirit's role in creation so the father was the one who planned everything. He's the author. Okay, what is um, um, Christ's role in creation? He brought about, um, he spoke what was to be created and what is the Holy Spirit's role in creation? As he brings it to uh, pass. So God the Father planned it, Jesus spoke it and the Holy Spirit brought it to pass, okay? And uh, where do we see this? Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1, 2, 3. Okay. So we're studying about Christ's deity. What else did we study to prove from, script, uh, from scripture that Jesus Christ is God? Apart from him being the creator? His equality with the Father and the Holy Spirit. So we looked at various scripture references. Uh, which proved his equality with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And what else did we look at?
you have your notes in front of you instead of looking at me and looking puzzled please look at your notes at least it can come back to memory what is chapter 1 talk about yes the pre existence of christ that means he existed before all things he existed before time he existed even before the foundations of the world okay so we are looking at christ deity how in christology we how humanity coexisted in the person of jesus christ so we looked at um, uh, his pre existence because you know that's how we can prove that uh, he is god we also saw his equality with the father and the holy spirit and we saw his role in uh, creation okay um <clears throat> so uh, you know where are we proving all this from from scripture right we're looking at scripture because scripture is the one uh, that helps us to prove that jesus christ is is fully god he is a uh, deity uh, that he is not just humanity okay and uh, last week we looked at his uh, role in creation so which uh, um uh, reference in scripture that we meditate on or we study on colossians chapter 1 verses 15 to 18 okay 17 18 okay but uh, specifically looking at we looked at colossians chapter 1 verses 16 and 17 what was uh, what does it say about christ there in colossians chapter 1 verses 16 and 17 by him all things were created all things were created by him through him and for him and in him all things consist okay that means he is the one who sustains all things okay now i'm not going to ask you if you have any questions because i don't think any of you have read your notes for you all to have any questions but anyone has any doubts you'll have anything that any thought that crossed your mind any doubts no yes yes rin please take the mic so that our online students can also hear uh, a verse 15 uh, it says he is the image of the invisible god mm -hmm. mm. so it's talking about jesus right Yes, he is uh, talking about Jesus. He is the Im image of the invisible God. Yes. So, um, like when Jesus he came to the earth and uh, he appeared in the form of man, and uh, like, can we also say like um, this line? He's the image of the invisible God means like he. So we can. This is how Jesus God looks. <laughs> okay. What do you think? This is how God looks. What does scripture tell about who God is? God is spirit. spirit. He's a spirit. Yes. He has no yes, thank you. He has no form or shape. But if God had to become man, he had to take on a human form. Okay? So that is how he looked as a human being. But then God has no form or shape. I mean, if God does not have any form or shape, then uh, why did He say in the beginning, like, let us make man in our image? Yes, let us make man in our image. So, what does it mean? It does not mean in the sense of a form of how they look, but in that, in the sense of God never dies. He created us never to die. God is sinless. He created us to be sinless. uh god has a, a a mind in which he thinks he gave us a mind in which we can think uh god is sovereign he does what he wills he gave us a will so that we can choose you know and also gave us a mind so that we can perceive and understand what god is uh, speaking to us so in that way we are created in his image and likeness so image means not exactly in the way that of a of a shape and a form but in terms of all of this that god is perfect he is holy he is um uh, sinless um you know he never dies he created us perfect he created us without sin he created us never to die he gave us a mind so that we can perceive understand the heart of god he gave us a will so that we can 
that's why jesus uh, god never overrides our will in any aspect he never overrode um, um, uh, eve's uh, will he told them not to eat from the tree but it was their choice you know he doesn't treat us like puppets on a string so that's how we are created in his image okay his will so god is a spirit being but yes you know we can see him we can understand how he looks as a human being but that's not how he really uh, is right talking more about his nature and attributes good question okay okay anyone else has any other questions okay if not we will move on so we've looked at um, christ's role in creation and through uh, you know colossians chapter 1 verses 15 to 17 specifically we looked at verses 16 and 17 we tried to prove that uh, we proved that jesus is the uh, creator okay so what should be our response you know even as we um, look at all of this we need to pause and consider and meditate and um, you know um, ponder on all who christ is okay look at ponder meditate consider all who he is as a uh, as a uh, 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 deity and also as humanity yes nina Yes, Nina, you have your hand up. You can unmute your mic and speak. Yeah, sorry. Uh, when we say uh, in the in his image, can we also say that um, you know we are also created to be spiritual beings essentially because he said he breathed into us the breath of life. Yes. So when we say image, can we say that too? essentially that uh, we are just residing in a body right with the capacities of a soul so i mean can we say that also when we say image yes we are spiritual beings we are spirit beings yes we can say that because god uh, uh, speaks to us in our spirit man and that is why when we are born again we are born again in our spirit man yes we can say that okay so, you know, we need to pause, consider, you know, meditate on all of his works, what he's done, you know, who he is as deity, who he is as humanity. Uh, because if you look at Psalm chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, can one of you please read Psalm 8, uh, 3 and 4? It's good when, when we are, um, you know, uh, uh, studying all this to just follow through with your notes so you know where we are. Um, Psalm chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. Can somebody read that, please? Uh, you'll have to take the mic, please. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you have take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? Thank you. So here we see that, you know, what is the psalmist doing? He's considering all the works of uh, God, everything that God has um, created. So take time to consider his nature, his attributes, his works, you know, just ponder, meditate on all who God is, his works. And what will, what will happen when, you know, when you begin to ponder on God's uh, creation, all his works, what, what would it result in? What do you think it will result in? It uh, will just help you see the greatness of God. Okay, what else? It will just reveal his glory, right? Because uh, uh, Psalms chapter 91 verse 1 says, creation reveals the glory of God. Okay. Can somebody read that? Psalm, uh, sorry, Psalm 19 1. Psalm 19 1. You can just pass on the mic so the next person can read. Psalm 19 1. And read a little loud, please. The heavens declare the glory of God and the, fir and the firmament shows his handiwork. Thank you. So here... You know, uh, heavens declare the glory of God. So when you look at creation, creation reveals the glory of um, God. Okay, that's what even Paul says. I've quoted the scripture 
you know, Paul, when he's writing to the church at Rome, uh, in Paul, in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, he says, For since the creation of the world, the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen. Since when God created the world, when people look at God's creation, what they can see, they can see his invisible attributes. You know, they can be understood, they can be seen, uh, they can see his eternal power and the Godhead. Even the Trinity is revealed in creation and they're able to see his eternal uh, power. And so Paul is saying people who do not have the law, who, uh, who, you know, who do not know God, they are without excuse because creation itself reveals the invisible attributes of God. It reveals, um, you know, his, uh, his, 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 uh, it reveals the Trinity, it reveals the Godhead, it reveals his eternal uh, power. So when we ponder, meditate, consider all that God has created, look at his creation, what is, our, what is it going to lead us to? It's going to lead us to glorify God because all creation reveals the glory of uh, God. And also like um, uh, Nina Santos said, it, it reveals the greatness of our God. Look at what Psalm chapter 147 verse 4 says. Can somebody else read that please? Psalm 147 verse 4. Just quickly pass the mic. Psalm 147 verse 4. Read verses 4 and 5. Check. He count the number of the stars. He calls them all by name. Great is our Lord. And mighty is in power. His understanding is infinite. Thank you. So here the psalmist is saying, you know, God counts the number of stars and he also calls them by name. Imagine the millions of stars in our galaxy, you know, and he knows each one of them by name. That is his greatness. And what does this uh, lead to when, when the psalmist is considering how great God is? Now, how great is his, the universe he created and everything that he created it? What is it leading him to do? It is leading him to exalt God. Okay. And then if you, in verse 5, he says, Great is our God, mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. Okay. God is truly infinite. He is great. Uh, he is dominant over all creation. And that is what we read in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 12 and 13. So can somebody please read Isaiah 40, 12 and 13. It's there in your notes. So if you want, you can read that. Who has measured the butters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in, in a balance? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has taught him? Thank you. So here we see uh, the greatness, the infiniteness of our God and his exceedingly great, uh, you know, incomparable power that he has, uh, which we can see in uh, creation. Okay. And so all of this not only leads us to, you know, glorify him, to exalt him, but ultimately leads us to uh, worship him. So it leads us to worship him for who he is, what he has done. Uh, worship him for his majesty, for his glory, uh, you know, for his greatness, for his infiniteness. Uh, so, you know, even as we're studying all this about uh, God, I hope it is going to uh, lead into us in, you know, something more personal, uh, not just, you know, coming to class and just going through the notes or listening to the lectures. But it's just going to result in you, um, you know, glorifying, exalting, and also uh, considering how great our God is. And, uh, you know, that we have this opportunity to, to learn, to serve, and to worship uh, this great God. And let it just, you know, uh, lead you or break forth. You can just break forth into worship, in song, in just adoration, uh, in just um, uh, glorifying him and worshiping him. Okay, so that is where we stopped um, uh, last class. We had to do the last bit of uh, lesson three. So anyone has any questions? Any clarifications? 
Anything? Our online students? Okay, if uh, there are no questions or doubts, we'll move on to chapter four. Okay, so basically, you can all turn to chapter four uh, in your notes. Basically, in chapters one, two, and three, we studied about the, we studied about what? The deity of Jesus Christ, that he is God. So we established the fact that Jesus is God. We looked at several uh, scripture passages which point to his pre-existence, his equality with the Father, the Holy Spirit, and his role in creation. Okay, so now since we've ex established the fact that Jesus is God, uh, we're going to move on to chapter 4 and chapter 4 and the subsequent chapters, uh, we will be talking or examining the humanity of Jesus Christ. So now since we've established the fact that Jesus is God, he's deity, we're going to look at, uh, we're going to examine the humanity of Jesus Christ. Okay, so was chapter 4. We're going to talk about the promise of his coming, but here the promise of his coming is not a promise of his second coming. Okay, uh, we'll talk about that later, but now we're talking about the, uh, the, the prophecies uh, that were um, spoken of uh, Jesus' birth, the, the birth of the Messiah, the coming of the Messiah. So we're, in this chapter, we're basically going to be looking at some uh, very important Old Testament prophecies. There are numerous Old Testament prophecies that talk about the birth of Jesus Christ, but we're not going to be considering all of them. We're just going to be looking at a few of those prophecies which talk about the incarnation of Christ. What is the meaning of incarnation? God taking on human form or God becoming flesh. Okay, now um, there are various prophecies that talk about Christ's birth, uh, his, um, his, um, his work, uh, you know, various aspects of his work, his second coming. But in this chapter, we are basically just going to be focusing on uh, his incarnation, the prophecies that foretold uh, his incarnation. Uh, we are also going to be studying prophecies uh, connected to the uh, different aspects of his work. Uh, we look at a few here, but then basically we're going to look at the whole study about the prophecies about uh, the work that Jesus came to do, his mission uh, in the subsequent chapters. But now we're just going to focus on the prophecies concerning his birth. Okay. Now, before we look at a few prophecies, important prophecies regarding the incarnation of Christ, uh, there are some important facts that we need to uh, consider or to have uh, in our minds. The first thing is, uh, when do you think God planned the whole aspect of incarnation? When do you think God, it came in the, in the mind of God that, you know, there should be a Messiah that, you know, uh, God should become man. When do you think this whole thought came into the mind of God? When did he plan this? Before creation, before the foundation of the world, The fall, after the fall of man, okay? Before the foundations of the earth, yes. You know, uh, before the he, God planned the whole thing, even before the foundation of the world, he did not plan it after Adam and Eve sinned, no. Uh, he did not plan it, you know, uh, when, you know, his other plans of choosing Israel as a nation who can bring about you know, his redemptive purposes and all of that. Somewhere in history, he, you know, in middle of history, he did not plan this, but it was planned even before the foundations of the world. Because even before the foundations of the world, in the mind of God, you know, Jesus Christ had already was dead, crucified, you know, and taken on the sins of the thing in the heart and mind of God, even before the foundation of the world okay so that is also very important to uh, note so here we see that incarnation was not something that came a thought that came in across god's mind somewhere after the fall of man no he knew everything he knew that adam and eve are going to sin but even before they sinned he had this plan of coming of the messiah even before the messiah came and jesus came and died on the cross 
everything was a done completed thing even before the foundations of the world okay thank you shiv kumar uh, he, uh, shiv kumar says uh, you know he he had this in mind even before um, creation so how do we know this um, you know um, uh, we know how do we know that incarnation was in the mind of god in the heart of god in ages past let's look at first peter chapter 1 verses 19 and 20 can somebody read that please first peter chapter 1 verses 19 and 20 but with the precious blood of christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you yes very important passage of scripture so if somebody ask you when did this whole plan of god you know when did god plan uh, to send his son when did the plan to Uh, you know uh, when did god plan to become man you know first peter chapter 1 verses 19 and um, 20 says even he foreordained it before the foundation of this world but was manifested you know which means it was revealed to us in this time so which means it was revealed to us god manifested in flesh in the kairos time kairos time means what the right time the fullness of time the god kind of time so we learned remember we learned the chronos time and the kairos time the chronos time is a chronological time that we are all going through the chronological time period in history but kairos time is the right time the fullness of time the god appointed time you know so at the fullness of time jesus became flesh he took on uh, flesh so that is the first thing that we need to remember that is an important fact that we need to remember the second important fact that we need to remember was you know when the jesus when was that fullness of time it was a time when the jews were anticipating more than ever before they were looking forward for the messiah why were they looking forward for the messiah because in their mind in how they um uh, interpreted the old testament prophecies was they knew that there would be a messiah would come okay so they basically they thought this messiah is going to come is going to be a king and who's going to liberate them and give them victory over all the enemies now we know that you know uh, the israelites were slaves in egypt and god took them to the promised land and he told them if you keep his ways and commands and will not you know follow the ways of the the cultures around and worship their gods you know then they would be blessed and they would live in that land and they would be prosperous but what happens if they you know follow the cultures and worship the gods around them what did god what was the punishment for them they would go into exile he would send their enemies and their enemies would treat them as slaves now one thing the israelites or the jews did not like was slavery but we see that you know uh, assyrians came the babylonians came uh, took them as captives you know but even though they came back uh, to uh, is uh, to their own land started building the temple started building their homes uh, nehemiah went and built the walls and everything you know uh, even then they were still under now when you know when jesus was born just before that they were under the romans now the romans were you know they ruled with a very uh, you know iron fist you know they were very uh, hard they were very evil very wicked and uh, uh, the jews were suffering under the roman rule okay not only were they ruled by these people they were also uh, to to worship uh, herod you know herod is uh, the the general name that is given to the the kings who ruled uh, in in um, in israel you know um, uh, they were to treat them as gods and also this romans taxed the jews so there were taxes like they paid taxes for every little thing okay so they were really looking out for a messiah they were they came to a point where they were so frustrated they were so disappointed that even in their religious systems uh, in the temple the the high priests were all connected with the roman government so even there there were taxes that they had to pay in for religious things so the people were thoroughly frustrated and it was like never before they were looking for a 
Messiah. Okay, so but the whole idea of them how they interpreted the old testament prophecies of this messiah would come was totally wrong because they interpreted the messiah would come would be a king a liberator who would give them victory over their enemies would establish uh, them as a sovereign uh, you know country a uh, rule and they would have freedom they would have their own laws they would you know, have their own say in doing things and not being, you know, not being um, subdued under other uh, rulers. Uh, so they thought this Messiah would come and be the king who would fight the battles and deliver them and liberate them and give them uh, freedom and have their own, you know, country and their own laws. But sadly, you know, they did not expect that the, the, the Messiah who would come would be the Lamb of God who take away the sins of the whole world uh, but they were looking for a liberator and that is why they were not willing to accept Jesus even though they tried to push him to that place where you know he would be the king but Jesus knew what was his role what he had come to do and they could not accept him as the messiah because you know they never thought this messiah would come as the lamb of God who would be slain to take on the sins of the Word. So these two things we need to keep, um, very important things that we need to keep at the back of our minds, these two important facts. Now we look at a few prophecies that talk about, um, you know, uh, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. The first one is in Genesis chapter 3, as early as, um, you know, um, uh, creation and the fall of man, Genesis chapter 3 verses 14 and 15. Okay, Genesis chapter 3 verses 14 and 15. So can one of you please read uh, Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15? The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the hill okay so what is it basically what is this passage talking about or these verses when god cursed okay this is after the fall when god cursed adam eve and now last of all he's cursing the serpent okay um so you know here if you look at uh, we'll study this in a little more detail okay um the uh, much of this verse you know these two verses uh, should, we should be seen in a figurative sense which means the one thing is said in a form of a figure of an another thing okay so we need to look at this whole verse in a very figurative sense which means one thing is said in the form or in the figure of something uh, or else of something or something else or in another thing okay for example the serpent here represents whom Satan, okay, Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, uh, we see that the woman here is representative of whom? Israel, okay, yes, you can go ahead and answer, don't worry, Mary, okay, human race, yes, actually, uh, the Catholics say that it's uh, representing Mary here, but it's not. It's basically talking about the human race uh, in general. It's talking about the entire human race. And if you look here in this passage, you will see seed. Okay, how many uh, times seed is mentioned, the word seed? Look in your Bibles, please. Or in the verse, how many times seed is mentioned? Two times, is there in your notes also, so you can look at your notes, two times. And is it different both the times? Yes, okay. How is it different? One is a small seed and the other is a capital seed, okay. So who do you think is the small seed referring to? Huh? Okay, look, read your passage and tell me, who is it referring to? Okay, Shiv Kumar says it's referring to Satan. Satan and Eve, seed, the word seed. And her seed, okay. 
So what is the first small seed with a small s? Who is it referring to? Satan. Okay. Look at the verse carefully. It says, I will put enmity between you and the women and between your seed and her seed. Okay. So it can be talking about Satan's seed, which is demons. But more literally here, it is speaking about the human race and those who are ungodly. Okay. It, it, some com uh, commentary writers say is referring to Satan's seed, which can be his demons, the fallen angels. But here it's literally meaning it's talking about those who are uh, ungodly, human race who are ungodly, who are you know, following evil, who are under Satan, under his power, okay, um, uh, him being the, their, their father, okay. And who is the capital S here referring to? Jesus Christ, yes. So remember, anytime we said we see a capital S in spirit, it's talking about God's spirit, the Holy Spirit, and it's talking about, it mentions a capital H, it's talking about, uh, it's talking about God, uh, any person in the uh, Trinity. Okay, so here um, the seed can be looked at as, uh, you know, it can be either considered as singular or collective. So one person or together as a human race. Okay, and uh, the, the capital S is uh, can also represent the people of God. The capital S can represent the people of God and also represent uh, Jesus Christ. Okay, and the words he and his could also be plural. Okay, look at that. Uh, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So here it can, it can refer to Jesus Christ. It can also refer to a single person. Okay, human being also can represent uh, collectively the people of God. Okay, now once we kind of... Uh, Look at this whole verse in detail, uh, we'll understand it uh, more uh, better, okay? So this, this whole um, Genesis chapter 3 verses 14 and 15, basically 15, is called as the proto-evangel or in the Greek proto-evangelim, okay? Which means the first gospel. What is the meaning of proto? Proto means the word proto, first, okay, first. Remember, we studied last week, proto in rank, a first in rank. Proto means first. Evangel means what? Gospel, evangelism, gospel, sharing the good news. Okay, so proto evangel means the first gospel. So here in the Bible, we see that God himself is speaking the, sharing the good news of the gospel. Okay, so where is it? Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. And what is the good news there? He sent the Messiah. Okay. What is the good news in uh, uh, the first gospel here that God is declaring? In Sorry? No, in this verse, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, I'm saying, He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Which means, you know, it's talking about what Jesus did on the cross. On Je When Jesus died on the cross, he disarmed Satan. He broke his powers. He considered all of Satan's power and his uh, works as nullified, as a done thing, as hopeless, as good for nothing. Okay, so he subdued Satan on the cross. Okay, so that is the first gospel that was preached. It's, this is the first messianic prophecy in the Old Testament. Messianic prophecy means what? Messianic prophecy means basically prophecy talking about the coming of the Messiah. Okay, and uh, it is also, this is Genesis chapter 3 verses 14 and 15 is referred to as the Edenic covenant okay god making a covenant in the garden of eden but if you look at it you will say here ma'am there is no covered covenant that is mentioned so how can we say it's an edenic uh, covenant okay um but this is mentioned in hosea chapter 6 verse 7 so can one of you please read hosea chapter 6 verse 7 
You know where the book of Hosea is? Hosea Joel, before Joel. Hosea chapter 6, verse 7. So can somebody read that, please? Hosea, Hosea chapter 6, verse 7. But like Adam, they have transgressed the covenant. There they have dealt, dealt treacherously. treacherously against me. Okay, so here it says, you know, this is basically talking in reference with Israel and Judah. Uh, but here it says, but like Adam, they transgressed the covenant there. They dealt, uh, they transgressed the covenant there. They dealt faithlessly with me. Okay, so it's referring to what happened in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, in some versions, like in KJV and NKJV, there is no word Adam mentioned there. I think it's in NIV, right? You read from NIV version? The NIV, it's mentioned Adam, NASB. But if you look at in your KJV and NKJV, there is no Adam mentioned there. It doesn't say but like Adam. But it, there it mentions like men. Okay, but if you look at the footnotes in your Bible, you know, it uh, the footnote says like Adam. Okay, so since the name Adam amongst all other things means man. Okay, one of the other meanings of the word Adam means man. So here it's basically referring to this, uh, you know, what happened at in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. And it's talking about that as a covenant. So what is a covenant? What's a covenant? You all learn covenants, right? Hello, class, wake up. You all learn covenants. Online students, what is the meaning of covenant? It's an agreement, just an agreement. You and I can agree that you have to come to class, then only I'm going to give you marks. That's an agreement. What is a covenant? Assurance of a promise, it's a binding agreement. It's a binding agreement, life for life, death for death. That is why covenants are made out of, in the Old Testament, made out of blood. Why? Talking about life and life. If you don't keep this covenant, it's, you know, your then you, I'm all entitled to take your life. Nina John says it's a solemn, yes, an unbreakable promise. You can't go back. It's solemn and unbreakable uh, promise. Okay. So here in the Eid, God makes a covenant, you know, and this covenant is the basis for all other redemptive covenants that, that are spoken of in the Bible or mentioned in the Bible. What do you mean by redemptive? Means God redeeming mankind from sin. God redeeming mankind from being slaves of Satan. Okay. So this is the first, the basis. So if you look at the first covenant, basically we think the first covenant God made with whom? Before that, we usually think the first covenant God made was with whom? With Noah, right? Yes, Noah, my gosh, all of you. Are <laughs> the first covenant God makes with Noah. We think that is the first covenant. But before that, there is the Edenic covenant, which God is making with uh, man here. And it's also proto-evangel, the first gospel that is being preached of the coming of the Messiah, where he's going to bruise the head of Satan. And what is the meaning of bruise your head? What is the meaning of head? Even the head word here is used in a figurative sense. The word head really means somebody who's supreme, a prince, a leader, a, a chief. So it's basically referring to whom here? Bruise your head. Whose head is Jesus going to bruise? Satan. What do you mean your bruise? Huh? To hurt. Okay, to bruise, to cause a wound. Okay, so here this head is basically talking about to bruise your head means he's going to not, you know, head here in terms of our uh, body part. It's talking about head. It's a figurative way of referring to Satan 
who is basically the supreme, the prince, the leader, the chief. Okay, so we'll stop here. Uh, we'll go for our break and then uh, we'll continue. Uh, before we go for our break, anyone has any questions? Any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, we'll go for our break and come back after our break. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> 